I mean, I've never been in a love triangle, but I don't know. You haven't? No. I haven't. It is not fun. It did not feel fun. It felt very stressful. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, I can't imagine it even being enjoyable in real life. No, I've been in a few, and they're not good. A few? They, I have. I believe you. Though, I, this is me absolutely believing you. Anyang SAO, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists, and your K Romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. So, how is everyone doing? It's, uh, it's Wednesday, and I'm happy that we're here. But it's it's been a day. Yeah. Like I just, I, yeah, I feel like we're all just a little bit frazzled right now, but we're happy to be where we are. So, yay that it's Wednesday. Yeah, I would rather be here than on writing deadline, which I was frantically for the last two weeks. Um, but now I finally feel free. I like cleaned my kitchen today. I made apple cinnamon bread. I made like a full dinner with like meatloaf and potatoes. Like <laughs> my husband came that, home. Wow. And was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's what I, that's what I feel like doing. If I'm not like on a writing deadline, then I'm like, you know, making myself treats. <laughs> I made soup this weekend, and I realized how much I really enjoy making soup. I love like soup. Like, what kind? Um, this time, I, so I tend to just kind of, like, do soup, you know, like, without a recipe. Oh. <laughs> but this time, I just bought a bunch of, like, wintry vegetables, like, squashes and sweet potatoes, roasted them all up put in a lot of garlic and onion and just kind of like did that whole thing. And then I just threw in like kale and spinach, I just, spinach and peppers. I mean, I basically just threw like any vegetable I could roast or had green leaves and put it in. And it was like a very, it was very healthy and very delicious. That sounds and amazing. It was just full of garlic, which makes everything better. I will agree with you there. But then here's my question. Do you puree it or like, or is it just all just a chunky soup? Yeah, so this time I wasn't sure I was going to puree it, and then I was feeling the chunky, and then I was like, mm, I'd rather have chunky with, like, French bread, but I don't think that's going to go over well with the kids. So I pureed about three-fourths of it, and then I left, like, a little bit of chunk okay, to it. Okay. <laughs> like, what color was the final soup? Um, it was a unattractive diarrhea. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> like, I feel like, I thought I feel I like, like it's <laughs> something you'd find in a newborn's <laughs> diaper. Yes. And I had put cumin in it, which did not help. Right. No. But my whole thing is that, like, I don't mind what my food look. It, it was an it was it fit within my personal color scheme, which is brown. <laughs> um, I knew it was a health bomb and it tasted really good. Another one that I really like. So my my soups tend to not be really colorful. And like the ones that are colorful and non kind of blended chunky, I don't like as much. I will say um, I'm kind of like more lukewarm, like a minestrone. Like I'm not into that kind of type of consistency soup. I like real chunky kind of like peasant soups. Um, but a real favorite I have is one that's pear and parsnip. Mm. And I cannot highlight that one more. So that's just garlic or that's just onion, parsnip and pears, mm -hmm. chicken stock, blend the fuck out of it. And then like put Gouda on top. Oh my it. gosh. And it's kind of like a little bit sweet. It's mostly savory. Then you do a little bit of the cheese and you have it with like okay, good bread. Okay, that actually bread. sounds delicious. Yeah, I actually, I actually need that recipe. Yeah. Oh my God, that's Well, I just gave it. That's, that's the that's recipe. Literally, oh. lis listeners, that's the recipe. Oh, you're like, I don't know. I just throw <laughs> it a, well, do you roast it first? I think roasting makes everything better. Okay. So I don't always, but I would say that if you're going to have the time roasting before boiling, always roast. Okay. 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 That sounds amazing. See, I'm like, I am, I do care about like the presentation of my food. And so sometimes I will have like a whole system, like, <laughs> like a whole like assembly line on how to like put your plate together. So like Neil will always be like, oh, well, what do I put on next? Like he has, Are you serious? He wants to come over. He wants to come over and put on all the garnishes. Like he wants the. <laughs> do you mean I for like, what, a, for just like I, a regular, like tonight's like family dinner? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I do like the whole thing. I'll have like chopped parsley. I I think I grew up watching the Food Network. Like you don't understand. You put a like, parsley garnish on like your Wednesday night dinner plate? Yes. <laughs> Do you eat the parsley? Well, yeah, the parsley's a I don't use it as like a garnish. Like that's like a seasoning on top of like whatever I make. Oh, okay. So, so you're talking like chopped parsley. 
Not like a sprig yes. of parsley on the side. No, okay. uh, no, 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 no. Because that's like the gross, like that. Yeah. The curly parsley is gross. You got to get like the flat. Okay, the that's different. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, yeah. No, I don't. But I mean, I do like the full thing. But yeah, and I like I just so you know right now, self care. After I, I wrote like a mad woman, I had to finish this book, and I turned in the book. I was brain dead, and I said to everyone in my household, I was like, "Don't talk to me." I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch the latest episode of the Great British Baking Show. And that is all I want to do. And if anyone interrupts me, there is going to be hell to pay. And I did. I sat that honestly, the Great British Baking Show is I've, it's self-care. I've never watched it. I keep I've, I know everybody says they love it. It's I've never so watched wholesome. It. Oh, my God. It's I the never, most wholesome thing you'll ever you'll ever watch. It's wholesome. I also never I also never. I just yeah, I oh don't God, I, I don't it. I don't. I I'm not no, and I'm yeah, not. I'm not yucking it. I just don't. For you. I've never had the interest. Like it's, it's not. It's not. Did mm. you guys like watch cooking shows? Ever? No. Not with up. like. Not with. I watch Is It Cake because my daughter <laughs> likes it, oh. and that sometimes she wants to bond with me. But I will not seek out a cooking show aspirationally. My goal in life is to cook everything in one pot. <laughs> oh my god! Like Rachel Ray raised. Oh me. no! <laughs> no. Like more than my own no, mother. No, the closest I ever got to a cooking show was nailed it. <laughs> to watching a cooking show was nailed it, which is I mean nailed it's great, but I want like a full cooking show that teaches me how to cook, and the, so I did. Like my mom wasn't a a, a great co- like she's a great mom. Cooking is just not her thing, and so mm-hmm. I think growing up I like wanted then mm-hmm. to like, and so that's what. That's, and my mom's that's a great that's cook, so I, maybe it's just maybe I I just realize I'm never gonna do what she does, so I'll just leave it to everybody else. And maybe that's what happens because Bronte is also really enjoying cooking. And I don't mind. Like, I find a lot of value. Like, I am going to make a claim. I know I eat like a trash panda some nights. <laughs> but I will say that like a one pot meal, I find to always be pretty satisfying. I love one pot yeah. meals. Are you kidding um, me? Yeah. yeah. And gosh. so, yeah, anything that's like a hearty peasant stew, a lamb stew, a heavy vegetable stew, anything that's like cook a curry, anything that I cook in like one big pot is good. But I have a question because you said this and now I'm curious and listeners might be too. We are K-drama focused. We will never not be K-drama focused. But what is a go-to comfort watch show? Like, okay, so we had the the Great British Bake. Is the it great? great? The Great British Baking Show on Netflix. Okay. Do it's, they have like a okay British baking show or it's just the great? No, it's the great great British. I think it used to be the great British bake off, but then like, okay. I think it changed hands somehow. It's the same show. But okay. honestly, when I, when I went to like London, I like looked up to maybe go visit the tent because they, they like cook in this uh-huh. tent. Like I am aware there's a tent. Okay. Like that's how much I love this show. I love it. And it's like 11 seasons. Like it's so much content if you really like it. So, Amy, what's a go-to non-K-drama? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're just going to put something on, one-off, low investment. Yep. We, my, my kids and I do this all the time. Um, Parks and Rec or The Office. Yeah. Okay. Good ones. What about you, Leah? For me, it's either Queer Eye, if I need to cry. <gasps> I love Because I will, I will never not cry watching Queer Eye. Same. I don't care what the fuck happens. Mm-hmm. I am going to cry at some point on Queer Eye. So it's either Queer Eye or Alone on the History Channel, which is like, you know, the 10 people dropped off. I That's a comfort that. show? Oh, my God. Oh, it's so good. Oh, yeah. Because I sit there with a snack being like, not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, alone, <laughs> alone is really good. It's so good because it's not like dummies. Like, it's like people. Well, it used to be. So we went oh, back because I went back and watched the very beginning again. Right. And oh, I mean, my husband was like, turn it like we were like 20 minutes in. He's like, just turn it off. <laughs> just turn it off. Because now it's got like very good survivalists. Yeah. Uh-huh. I love at the beginning. I- it was like people that were like, oh, my God, I hear a bear. I got to get the <laughs> fuck out. And they were gone in like one night. Yeah. I, 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 rem- I did watch the first season because yeah. uh, my friend told me to. Uh, we, we had watched like the latest season. She's like, no, you got to go back to the first season because it's a yeah. whole different experience. That's what I, yeah, that's what I was like. Go back and watch it. And my husband was like, I can't. I can't. Turn it off. <laughs> they were like, oh, my God, I think I hear a bear. They're like, come get me and made, <laughs> the, and made the crew and made the crew trek through like the jungle at like 2 a.m. In fairness, there were bears, but I will say the bears seemed like they didn't give... They were, like, vaguely curious bears. Yeah. It's a great show. I mean... <laughs> it is a great I, show. 
I, I don't watch really like it. any reality TV. Like no baking. I no, know you I don't. said that before. I've never. Yeah. I've never. I will. Like so, you don't watch, but you watch Queer Eye, right? Or you don't watch Queer Eye even? I've watched like an episode here or there, but I never watched it religiously. Yeah, you're just um, not a reality. I'm not a real. I mean, like the real. The I mean, real Jonathan world Van Ness. Thirty years ago, you know, like, but that was about no. it. No, Jonathan. Jonathan Van Ness, Tan. I mean, these are like the people I want to just like only hang out with in my life. Yeah. Oh, so okay, yeah. no. So now I'm I'm like having a major like part pocket of my brain that's opening up. So I haven't had cable in a long time, right? So I and, and I know you don't need cable to watch oh. a lot now, but when I did have cable, so I'm a big fat liar. I did watch a shit ton of HGTV. Like I love home stuff. Oh. <laughs> I watched a lot of HGTV mm. and on TLC, I watched um what not to wear? I lo- I used to love what to- what not to wear. <gasps> I love mm. what I loved what yeah. not to wear. Of course, it, it does not age well. Have you ever gone? I'm back sure it's terrible. Watched- like it does not age yeah, well. No. They like shame these people. Yeah. It's bad. I know. It's bad. <laughs> but my cousin was on. Um, what's the apartment? One? Like the like the tiny like it was like the house. Hunters. Yeah, I loved house hunters. Yeah, so my cousin is, like, one of, like, the couples on House Hunters that, like, does, like, the whole house hunting and, like, gets a house. Oh, my gosh. That's so fun. What? What episode yeah. of our podcast did you tell the story about how you're on Top Chef? <laughs> I it was a know, long time ago. You you look up Maui Wowie, <laughs> Top Chef, and I am front and center as a member of the studio audience. You cannot tell, but I am drunk out of my brain. <laughs> And then I passed out behind the quick fire challenge stand in mayonnaise. I got third degree sunburns because it was Hawaii. I basically, I can't, I'm not going to retell it. You know, we will try to find which episode, because you have to it's, hear the full it's thing. It's season 11, uh, you just season, 11 season 11, episode 16 of is Maui Waui, according to my quick Google search. Yeah. And I am there. I am in a, I have a bob, a very sharp bob. I'm with my gay best friend, Christopher, who had broken up with his boyfriend and had no plus one to Hawaii. So I went. I'm in a green dress. And I mean, like, if you see a picture of me, I don't look. I always look vaguely the same. It's not like, oh, my God, who who's Leah? I'm in the front nodding, trying to get on television. <laughs> the <entire laughs> episode. You just can't tell I'm as drunk as I actually was. And then I disappear because I was so drunk. I passed out. <sighs> story Mm -hmm. but yeah my my cousin um is on a hgtv i'll try to find it for the show notes but they did um it was like a tiny home version and what was i don't know can i contractually disclose this i think i can it is they already own their home Oh yeah, like oh, yeah, they yeah. they already by the time they show it. No, we know that. Yeah. So they had to like hide yeah. their furniture and like empty out the home. Yeah, it's so and then dumb. be like, what home is what I pick? Yeah. And then at one point, like my cousin's boyfriend like touches a beam and is like, What a cool beam. And it's the beam he'd like built. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so uh well would you I want say- my husband to be on queer eye. I want to put my husband on queer eye so bad. I don't think he would ever forgive me. But I want to be like, Jonathan, please come to my home. Bobby, Bobby, I need a better bedroom. Trim his (laughs) eyebrows. Okay, look, 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 look. (laughs) He has a hair. And no judgment. Like, we all get weird hairs. It's just that, like, they're solvable problem hairs. Like, you don't need to, like... You You don't have to just deal with it. You don't have to... Yeah, sometimes I just catch a weird hair. And I'm like, oh, don't want that hair, like... Get that I out will, of there. I will have, like, one eyebrow hair that's longer than the rest of my <laughs> eyebrow, and I just pluck it out. Like, bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every blue moon, I find a bizarre hair on my neck, I will say. Like, it's not often, but sometimes I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why do I have, like, a pasta noodle <laughs> on my neck? I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a hair that is growing off the center of his earlobe. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> and it is black. No. <laughs> and I'm like, just pull it off. Like there's no like like there's no rule. Like you don't lose your dick <laughs> if you pull the hair off your ear. Oh my God. And so any any when you say center of the earlobe, do you mean like 
on the bottom or like where it would be pierced? Where it would be pierced. <laughs> no. There's just a random long black hair coming off. And I keep being like, just take it off. Like, just, I can't. He has to get rid of it right now because I'm going to think I about it. I would do that in his <laughs> Seriously, sleep. I would, I would pluck that fucker in his sleep. <laughs> it would absolutely pluck it in his sleep. His eyebrows, his eyebrows are horrific. I mean, like, and this is the thing. It's like, I feel like I can call it out. Because I'm not like, oh, there's nothing you can do about it. I'm not like, oh, you're just, like, ugly. He's not ugly. It's just, like, take your hair that's growing white, like your eyebrows. I feel like he almost is like, well, I have a PhD. So somehow so it's, he like, should have really Einstein, So he have should have, like, Einstein eyebrows. Fucked up. <laughs> yeah. I just need to have fucked up eyebrows. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you just go to the barber and they take, they take the nose hair, the ear hole hair, the eyebrow hair. And then the odd earlobe <laughs> hair, and they just take it away. And so if you are listening at home, <laughs> and you are a man, this is easy. Like, there, there is an industry set up to remove that hair. You do not have to live like that. And, and I would argue, be curious mm-hmm. how you would feel being unburdened by that hair. Yeah. There's just some, I mean, I'm just telling you, the roots of... Whew, How could you even grow I can't hair? stop imagining the earlobe hair, and it's going to... <laughs> too. I can't ni- stop It's going to give me it. nightmares. It's just a single hair, too. It's not like a patch. It's just a single How hair. How long is it? That's that's worse than the healer hair, <laughs> mole hair. Oh that's worse. God. It's not like the healer mole hair. It's not like, it doesn't, it isn't horrible, and you... It's just one, so you kind of, like, can forget about it. And then you'll be like, wait, 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 wait. Like, did you, like, did you shed a hair? No. Nope. It's attached. You didn't shed a hair that you're low. Yep, still attached. <laughs> I would say it's, like, the size. I'd say it's the second knuckle on the pinky. That's pretty like, long. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not hanging to his shoulder, but it's not just, like, a little poof. That's a long hair. Does mm-hmm. your lobe hair hide low? <laughs> and I'm like, don't give up on this merit. Don't give up on us. <laughs> if you love like, me, <laughs> you'll pluck that hair. I'm just saying, like, there. <laughs> yeah, and I sometimes feel like he's just kind of like, this is just like how this works. This is where we end up. No, you like, have no. control. <laughs> At you some are point, in charge. You, you are need- in charge of the hair on your yes. body. And I had a conversation when Becky from It's Bananas came out to the Rose. We had a conversation. And if Becky's listening, I'm sorry if I'm butchering it. Because I'm just trying to get, like, the gist of the spirit. But it's the idea that, like, we have friends. And you might have friends, too. And you might be this person at home. And if you are, I'm going to challenge you. Where, like, at some point you've decided you're too old for some piece of technology or some advancement. You're like, it's, it like, basically, like, I've stopped here. The rest of you are going on without me. Like, I'm just this. I've hit like I'm at the spot. Right. I'm here. Like everyone else is just going to keep going. And I just want to challenge like, no, no, keep trying. Like, try to just like crawl along, like keep going. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at some point he was like, your lobe hair has come. This is where I leave you all. Like, (laughs) this this is just who I am. This is my. I am the man with the earlobe hair. I am one with the earlobe hair. <laughs> we are almost at 20 minutes. And I really, I know. like, I, I always enjoy here. when we don't know. <laughs> Why do we I... always do this? We're like, we don't really have much to talk about. And then all of a sudden we're talking about earlobe hair and it's 20 minutes in. What the hell? And then we're going to get a review that's going to be like, the hosts aren't nearly as funny as they think they are. <laughs> Look, I'm just, I'm sorry. I think sorry. fucking I'm... hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy when we get that review, though. The hosts aren't as funny as they think they are. I'm like, I, I mean, that's objective. That's do you think subjective. I'm, do you think I'm <laughs> fake laughing? Because I'm not. Like, I'm legitimately laughing every time. So if I think we're funny. It's a superpower to like yourself. It is. Okay. I amuse myself all day. So would you say that the earlobe hair is the B plot of your... No, it, for Nick, it's the main story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the B plot between the dog, <laughs> between the dog and the earlobe hair. I'm the B story. <laughs> I forgot about the dog. Between oh, his shit. love affair, his yeah. sick love affair with our Labrador, yeah. 
and his earlobe hair. That's our main story. Like, if Nick was in a movie of his life, it'd be like the man, the hair, the dog. <laughs> And then I would be as the wife, the B story. You're like the you're like the one dimensional wife <laughs> who just pops in every now and then to say pluck your hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's your one line. Yeah, I come running by with like a bunch of electrical equipment that's not working properly, and then I exit the scene. I mean, that's and, accurate. And your, and your diarrhea accurate. soup. And your diarrhea soup. She's got a bowl, My diarrhea soup. A bowl of soup and a mic that won't connect to her laptop. <laughs> I can't. My stomach hurts. <laughs> So what are what are we talking about today besides oh, my husband's earlobe hair? Oh my god! And look, this is his fault. If he listened to the podcast, I would rate it in more. But the fact <laughs> he's objectively non curious means it's all on the table, right? He'll never know. Don't care. Oh shoot! All right, so we are talking today about what I am in my marriage, which is the B story. <laughs> so <laughs> this is also known as the subplot. <laughs> And it's the secondary storyline that runs mar- parallel to the main plot, or what you know you might also call the A story. And the thing is, is that the B story does have a purpose. A good B story is not there just to be filling. It's there to add depth, complexity, and char- character development to the overall narrative. So let's go through a, some of the key points to understand the purpose of B stories. So I'm going to go through a couple, and then I'll take one of you to jump in. How does Sounds that sound? Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Okay. So the first thing with a B story is character development. B stories often focus on the personal lives, relationships, or internal struggles of main characters. They allow the audience to see different facets of characters and explore their motivations and growth. Another one is emotional resonance. B stories can provide emotional contrast or resonance with the main plot. I'll turn my phone to silent too. <laughs> <laughs> they may introduce themes or conflicts that are parallel or even contrast with the A story, and that all again ad- adds more depth and complexity. Like if I'm roasting a diarrhea colored soup, mm-hmm. I want to have a lot of depth and complexity to offset that color. Mm-hmm. And then the last one I'll share before I hand it over is thematic elements. So sometimes the B stories will introduce um, thematic elements or ideas that relate to central themes of the story and can help reinforce the themes or even contrast them. And that will add some depth to the overall narrative. Um, So number four, comic relief. In some cases, the B story serves as comic relief or provides moments of levity to break up the tension in the main plot. I think we have all demonstrated comic relief very well. We are our own comic relief sometimes. We are. And then interconnection. A well-crafted B story should ideally be connected to the A story in some way, even if indirectly. The two storylines may intersect or influence each other, creating a more cohesive narrative. Resolution. B stories typically resolve by the end of the story, and their resolution can sometimes influence or be influenced by the resolution of the A story. This can provide a satisfying and cohesive ending. For example, in a crime drama, the A story might revolve around solving a murder case, with the B story following the lead detective struggles in their personal life maybe a relationship with their family or a love story. The detective's personal challenges might influence their behavior and decision-making in the murder investigation. In screenwriting and storytelling, the use of B stories can enhance the overall narrative and make it more engaging and relatable to the audience. So what is a classic or iconic B story that has left a lasting impact on storytelling as a whole? And what elements made them memorable or influential? So my favorite romance movie of all time is When Harry Met Sally. Like super classic 80s romance. Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal. Sally and Harry. So it has a really great B story. So while Harry and Sally are the main story, the B story is Sally's best friend, who's played by Carrie Fisher. Um, Her character is Marie. And Marie falls in love with Harry's best friend, Jess. And that is like a driving force through the main story. 
Harry and Sally, it starts out with Harry and Sally going on a double date with Marie and Jess, trying to set each other up with their best friends, but Marie and Jess basically fall for each other instead. And they hit it off, and they get engaged, they move in together, all this stuff. And Marie and Jess's B-story romance basically becomes the vehicle for continuing to push Harry and Sally geographically together and eventually romantically together. It's like been that. a long time since I've seen that. I watch movie. it every year. Like, yeah, I haven't seen it like every year. I, yeah. Every year? Wait, like, do you have a time? Like, is it like a winter? I like thing, it around the holidays. A... Yeah. I like it around... yeah. Okay. So for me, I'm going to talk about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is probably one oh, of my. Oh, God. <laughs> what? I love this. The sec the B plots in this are hot to me. I thought you were gonna I thought you were gonna like say you didn't like it. So it's No, I love oh Ferris. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh my cats are my my they're well mm. they passed away. Aww. But my <laughs> my cats were um named after Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Anyway, so the B plot is about Cameron. What's interesting to me about Ferris Bueller's Day Off? So so Cameron. Ferris Bueller's Day Off is about Ferris Bueller, who plays hooky. Like, that's a very simple plot. He plays hooky from school. He convinces his girlfriend and his best friend to come with him. And they have all kind of Chicago shenanigans downtown. That is what they do. That is what the... It's, it's simple. But it's also Matt. Uh, and Cameron is kind of the B story. And so Cameron lives in this rich house with mostly absent parents and he is kind of like a neglected kid uh and he's very buttoned up because of that uh ferris says that cameron's house is like a museum and uh they take cameron's father's ferrari and uh on this whole escapade to chicago and they have this idea, they're like, because obviously the dad knows how many miles is on this Ferrari. He has it, like, in this special, like, garage in his house with, like, glass uh, walls and everything. And they're like, oh, we'll just reverse it for a while. And that's how we'll get the miles off of it. That's what they think at the end. Um, but the B story is really about Cameron kind of learning. It's very much like a coming of age, like, new adult plot line for him. Um, to me... Cameron actually might be the main um, character. There's like some, I've seen some debate about Ferris Bueller's Day Off that actually uh, the whole movie is about Cameron. Um, but I would say if you're looking at it, like if you're looking at the screenplay, Cameron's, Cameron is, is the B plot. The main plot is, or the main character is Ferris Bueller Day Off. But, or the main character is Ferris Bueller. Um, but I love Cameron. I think he's the heart of the um of the movie and I think he's what gives Ferris's day off purpose. Mm, I, I'm obsessed with Cameron. Yeah, me it's too. such a great I mean, it's such a great movie. And I I I've heard people say that Ferris is the villain that like Yeah, accurate yeah. too. Yeah, I mean I, I, still I love, love him, it. But yeah, I love I mean I love the movie and I and I do not think of Ferris as a villain, but I have seen that that talk. I can't say yeah. I can't say nine times without going nine, nine times. times. Even like, my kids. That's what I love is like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a mid eighties movie, but it's like timeless. Like my kids love it. My kids quote it. Like it's the best. Well, and I think on the surface, again, it's like, oh, he's just, he's this kid playing hooky, doing things in Chicago. But Cameron's character yes. mm -hmm. is the reason that sh mm -hmm. that movie means so much. He's the emotion of the show. He's the, or gosh, movie. He, it's a movie. He's the emotion of the movie. He's and, the growth. And everything. Like he, and he's the one who he changes. He's the growth. Oh, yeah. absolutely. He's the, he, he's the one who has the character arc. Mm -hmm. Ferris, Ferris, Ferris the is the same arc. person at the beginning and the end, but we love him for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When his I sister's get sick, pretty great, too. That's also, his, his, yeah, his sister's, sister's a really great. good B plot, too. Yes. But when I get sick, I lay in bed. And I sing the when Cameron when was in, was in Egypt's land. Egypt's land. <laughs> yeah, and then also we even went to the Institute of Art, the Chicago Institute of Art, because the most poignant part. What of did the we whole go take a picture of? Me is yeah. when he's 
staring at the Impressionist painting and it just zooms in until the dots become unrecognizable and you can barely just see like the little child with the like the gaping mouth and mm. they've got that music playing and oh, yep. it's just like it's so poignant so good I love it. I love the movie. I've loved it ever since I was a kid. I have it on VHS. Thank you for bringing it up. I I mean, like, talk about, like, multi-generational. Yeah, like, my my dad will, like, he and his friends will make reservations as Abe Froman. (laughs) The source of of Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) So great. So I've talked about mine before. I will talk about this forever. Oh. I am just never going to not talk about it. I know what this is, yeah. Tell me what it's going to be. The last of the Mohicans. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> so I will talk about this until my dying fucking day. Because no, do it. The only reason I got into the romance game was probably due to the B story of this fucking movie, which I have watched since and decided is actually slightly. It's it's not even slightly cheesy. It's very cheesy. I I really appreciate that Daniel Day Lewis just goes all in on the dialogue in this because there's ridiculous purple prose in this movie. Really, it's been a long time since I've seen it. So if you watch it, yeah, yeah, that's my caveat okay. is that the purple prose in this is it just leaves you with bruises. So yeah, okay. <laughs> However. The B story, where I don't even think on camera the two converse with mouth words to each other, is it's all about Uncas. And I know I've talked about it. If you know, you know. If you've listened, I've had listeners reach out and be like, yes, this too was my sexual awakening. He is the hot indigenous foster brother to Daniel Day-Lewis. And he, throughout the movie, develops a slow burn feel for the very milk toast little sister of the heroine who basically his whole job is to look around with her mouth kind of open like huh oh i'm scared (laughs) i don't care the dappled light on his face the way he watches her like climb up a waterfall the way he grabs her at one point and holds her like they never actually talk as far as i can tell and there's like three scenes that they interact And then we lead to the pivotal black moment of the whole drama that involves the two of them. No spoilers. If you have not seen it, just watch and watch for Uncas because the, I finished it in my journal diary. Like I saw a funny meme that was like, if you want to go to a real haunted house, it would be the ghosts reading the poetry that you wrote when you were 16. (laughs) No, no. For me, it would be going. Oh my God. There's Uncas. For me, it would be... Yeah, Amy showing a photo. For me, it would be going to my seventh grade journal and unpacking the feelings I put in it about Uncas after Last of the Mohicans. Because I went home and I fucking died into my journal. Yeah. And I'm not even a journaler. And I have pages written about this guy. That's amazing. I would actually pay to read that. (laughs) I'm just like, it has touched... A part of my soul. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. My mom actually brought over a bunch of books and uh, that, was, that were at her house that were mine. And one of them was a diary that I had. Ooh. And mom's like, you might want to read that. I was like, did you? She's like, yeah. <gasps> I'm like, you read it? She's like, you, it was it from fifth grade. I'm like, mom. As, uh, so because she read it, I am fucking horrified. And I I have not cracked it open. I don't want to know. Oh, I totally mind. feel you there. I'm terrified. She's like, well, you're like 40 now. I didn't think it was a big deal. I'm like, mom. Yeah, no, it's wild to me to realize that my mom must have read my diaries. Like, I think my mom just openly read my diaries when I like was at school. I've never talked to her about it because I don't ever want to hear it. And I also don't want to know that anyone ever saw what I wrote about Lucas <laughs> with my, like, the the most earnest. Like, I feel as if, like, you know, we all live our lives like a good romance main character with, like, our mask of identity that, like, lets us walk through this world as, like, a person that's protected. My emotional armor was down. I dropped all defenses to just, like, pour my Care Bear beam of love out of my heart to this Aww. fictional Uncas character. Aww. And to know my mom would have been, like, reading that as, like, on her smoke break as, like, a stay-at-home mom. Oh. No, thank you. No, <laughs> thank Do you. you. Um, are, are there any entries in your journals about Peter Tork? 
No, because Peter Tork came too early. <laughs> My monkey's obsession was in third grade, and I was not... I don't think... And it didn't hit me, like, because the thing about the Uncas period was that I didn't understand that what was happening to me was sexual. Oh, okay. I was just, like, right. I, I, was, I was set in seventh grade, so it was all, like, coming online, but I didn't know how to articulate it. All I knew is that, like, something had happened to my hardwiring, and I didn't know what was happening. Oh, little baby Leah, very confused. Yeah, just being, like, I'm dead for this dude. Right. But what... And it hasn't hit me in the same way until BTS Sugar. <laughs> That's like the only thing I have to compare it to in terms of being completely like like a level of reactivity that like is not normal or healthy, but yet is very fulfilling. Okay, so I have a question. Right. So the guy who played Uncas, so like Uncas right now is like ten years yeah. like ten years older than you, right? Yes, I watch. I, I see him on what TikTok. What if, um, what if, what if he had a hair growing out the middle of his earlobe? <laughs> I would like to think that he would be like, "My bad, luck," and then we are done. <laughs> and then we all just live our lives because you can't control the he- the hair coming out. Right, the hair is going to come where the hair is going to come. You control if you can't let that hair go. <laughs> <laughs> that's the lesson <laughs> is the hair like learn to release is the hair going to be the a story or the b story that's the question yeah and let let go of the things that aren't serving you <laughs> kill your darlings yeah and like nick's at a conference right now like i'm like are people noticing or not <laughs> noticing i don't know like how much are people looking at his ear it oh like God. second knuckle of the pinky, like that is a hair that I will not be able. I I will be like I will be like Austin Powers. But he's with other. Like, I'll be like Austin Powers staring at Fred Savage. I will just be like moly moly mo-. Like I wouldn't be able to stop. But like, re- but remember, you're like you as like who you are. He's at a bird island conference. I don't know if anyone like. Do they notice? I don't know. I do not know. Neil would never. He is. Oh yeah, Neil would pluck that. Oh my. Neil would never let it get that Neil long. Oh, Neil would pluck it immediately. <laughs> okay, so more personally, what's a B story that you've never gotten over in a story? So look, it's been like more than a decade. If you have not read The Hunger Games, I'm going to spoil something for you because it's Rue in The Hunger Games in the first book of The Hunger Games. Um, so Rue is uh, one of the competitors from a different district than Katniss in the Hunger Games, and they form an alliance, because that's what you do during the Hunger Games. You form an alliance with somebody until the bitter end, and then you have to kill them, because um, that's what the Hunger Games is. One person. One person <laughs> left standing. It's ki- kids killing kids. And this is, this is like the book that like got my daughter out of her reading funk in, um, during the pandemic. So I had given her Rainbow Rowell's Fangirl to read. I'm like, this is the book of my heart. It's one of my favorite books ever. I'm so excited for you to read it. And it took her like 30 years to read it because it just wasn't hitting for her. And then she read The Hunger Games. She's like, oh, I get it now. She's like, I need murder in my books (laughs) to keep me interested. No, so she, we love The Hunger Games. We love this B plot. So they formed this alliance. But they agree that they are not going to kill each other. They're going to find another way. But of course, Rue ends up getting killed by you know other competitors in the hunger games and it's super sad and it's a character that you get very very attached to and it definitely affects katniss um and the overall outcome of that first book um but it's devastating and i'm not i'm never over it like to the extent where when sydney my daughter read the books and then we were going to watch the movies. And so this is like, I've read the books. I've watched all the movies. Like I was, you know, there when the movies like were in the theater. So we're watching the movie together. And we both know that it's coming. We both know the exact moment it's coming because we, we know this story. And still it happens. And we're both like just sobbing because it's it's I just know. that. Like Suzanne Collins does such a great job with this B plot and how it basically because the whole point of of Rue and Katniss's friendship is to show the small subset of people like who have not lost their humanity through all that has gone on, you know, in Panem and with all of the districts and stuff like that, um, and how even when they're pit against each other and told only one of you can survive, they're like, 
I don't, I don't accept that. And I'm going to find another way. And yeah, I'll never be over it because she was such a wonderful character. So I'm actually, I'm glad you mentioned Rue because um, I am plotting a new book the other day and I broke out Save the Cat writes a novel, which we've talked about Save the Cat Mm -hmm. books and the beat sheets on this podcast before. And what's interesting is um, it in the, the story beats that's in Save the Cat writes a novel, when the beginning of Act Two is often the introduction of the B story. And in the book, um, they talk about the introduction of the B story character. And the B story character is a helper character, the person who's ultimately going to somehow help your hero learn the theme. So they usually come in the form of a love interest, a new friend, a mentor, or a nemesis. Um, and I think there's, I think Rue is really a classic example of that because Rue's kind of like, um, Rue does help Katniss hold on to kind of remind her of her humanity again when she's in this like crazy world. So yeah, I thought, I thought that was a really good one, Amy, a really good example. Mm. Thanks. So I know we're kind of talking about Western shows right now, but, uh, I'm going to talk about a K-drama. Cause I told you, cause I told you you had you to. That? I said a K drama. I said K drama. K drama. Like that. that's that's East Coast too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What accent is that? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, because Amy's like, um, aren't you going to mention uh, this character? And yes, uh, I haven't mentioned him in a while. So I'm going to talk about Un Gi from her private life, which is how I was introdu- introduced to An Bo Hyun, and I've been in love with him ever since. So yeah, that was that was a B story character that to this day I will never be over, and I don't have like a grand thing about it, like. Amy did with Rue. I just fucking love him. And I will talk about Ungi and his like plot line and his sad suit forever. And sad shower. Sad suit, sad shower. Oh, sad suit, sad yeah. shower. Just, you know, the way he just loves his adopted sister. <laughs> God, I love it. Oh my gosh. That just that just gave me an idea for like a future pod. Like we need to talk about like bananas backstories. Oh yeah, yeah we should. Oh my god, we That'd should. That would be a fun right? one. That would be a great yeah. one. That would be a good one. All right, I'm gonna go shortly with just a Western one, but it's a classic. And it is from Sound of Music, which is oh. another favorite of mine. And I'm gonna go with Liesel and Rolf. Because talk about the sweetest little, like, teen romance, and then he becomes a fucking Nazi. Ah. (laughs) And so it's, like, it's a good parallel to the overall plot, right? Because at the beginning, you're, like, charmed. He's, like, so cute, and, like, she's in love, and, like, they have their first kiss. Mm -hmm. And then as you kind of, like, follow the, like... The rise of the Third Reich in Austria and the impacts it's having to the family. And then you see this, like, cute little butter fnuffle become this, like, dude that's willing to, like, blow the whistle and sell out, the like, his first love and her fucking family. Mm. It's like, it just shows you, like, the stupidity and horror of that whole, you know, Nazi system in a very, like, simple humanistic way, which is, like, we really liked him. Now he's a fucking monster. That's what happens when you're yeah. a Nazi. Fuck you, Rolf. <laughs> Fuck you, Rolf. <laughs> the name of Fuck the you, pod- Rolf. Name of the pod- <laughs> <laughs> that could be the whole podcast. Yeah. Fuck you, Rolf. You were 16 going on 17. La, 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 la. Yeah. Kissy, okay. kissy, so happy, that's happy. That's my daughter's spring musical for her senior year, by the way. Oh, yeah. Sound music and, and their, awesome the choir trip during spring break that she is going on is to Germany and Austria. Hence why, why, <gasps> why they chose that for the, the spring musical. But yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so cool. Aww. Um, okay. So what's a B story you've enjoyed putting in your own writing and what purpose did it serve? So, I mean, it's not a, a, a hugely prominent story, but it, it's, it's a recurring, it's sort of a recurring small B plot. I'm going to call it a B plot because it is my psychic chicken named Lucy, um, who pops up in like all of my cowboy books and her, her main talent, like Lucy's talent is that she's only psychic when it comes to romance. 
And so, of course, these are romance books that I'm writing. And they're they're cowboy romance, like I said. So there's, like, you know, ranch and a farm. And that's why there's a chicken. And, um, yeah, she's a, yeah, she's a, a pretty smart hen. And she makes her appearance when it's necessary. And she's a little bit of a plot moppet B story. But it, it serves, she serves her purpose. And she serves it well. I love it. Um, yeah, so I have a book that's uh, set in an alien planet prison. (laughs) And uh, the heroine meets the hero. He's, you know, a big bad alien. And they try to escape and in doing so run into these little hobbit like creatures that are have dug themselves into like the walls of the prison because the prison is like a pit in the in the planet, like just like a big pit. You know what I mean? And uh, they've dug themselves into this little, like, home, this little burrow away from from the planet. And I called them hill bobs. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so cute. I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they're really cute. And they, like, talk sort of funny. And they, like, they're, they, they, like, bicker together because they've lived together for, like, 100 years. And I liked introducing them because it gave the heroine someone else to trust. Like, um... At the moment, she really only had this, like, alien hero to trust. And I always like giving the heroine someone else um, because I – it breaks up, like, I don't know, I guess, like, Stockholm Syndrome. Like, it's like I, – I, I want her to see that there's, like, better in this crazy planet um, than just, like, the hero. Like, there's other people to trust. And it just is, like, a nice – honestly, they were also comic re- – like we talked about the purpose yeah. of a of a B plot. They were a lot of comic relief. They were like funny. Um, they said silly things. They would tell each other they had bad knees. Like there was like a joke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can't do that with your bad knee. Like that kind of <laughs> You couldn't throw well well with your bad back, Ed. You couldn't throw him, you know, from yeah. <laughs> well, with your back, Ed, you shouldn't be throwing anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so that was I loved I loved them. They were really fun to write. Um, a B plot that I really enjoyed was from my Brightwater series, and I had a character named Grandma Kane, and she kind of her relationship with her grandsons, who were the heroes in all the books, kind of ran through as like a subplot for each of my stories, and it kind of like was like. Sometimes comic relief, sometimes poignant trauma dumping, but it was essentially like, you know, she raised these boys after their parents died in a tragic fire. And so her influence on them was like outsized to some degree. And I just enjoy writing cantankerous old ladies. And I felt like, yeah, she could come in at the beginning of one and be like a funny, crazy old lady who murdered my heroine's chicken that got out of the coop and like baked it into a chicken pot pie and like left it on her doorstep as like a welcome home mafia (laughs) gift to like you know more sad sweet kind of stuff with some of the other grandsons and so yeah over time i just i really liked writing that character and i felt like in each of the three books with um her grandsons like i kind of like developed a different side of her i like it too and who is a k-pop wreck i do not um look it's not k-pop but is it K-pop? Here's the question. So I'm going to just say that Jungkook, the maknae of BTS, put out Golden in the last week. And it's all in English. So, so I'm like, is it K-pop? Because it's all in English. It's pop. It's 100% pop. Mm-hmm. And look, I think it... I had less... at. I had less expectations. The thing is, is I think he's a savant. He's like freakishly gifted as a mimic. He has an amazing voice. He's like the whole package when it comes to like just being a little ball of like outsized talent. But he also isn't much of like a producer. Like he, this isn't like Jimin writing face and like revealing like his personal vulnerability. This was, you know, he received songs. He got to choose what songs he was selecting, but you know, he didn't write these songs. He performs them and he really sees himself as a performer. And the album's called Golden because uh, the nickname that the leader of BTS, um, Namjoon, gave him at one point was the Golden Maknae because again, he's just. He's just good at everything. He's just one of those people that's just good at stuff. Um, 
And so the first half of the album is very much about like falling in love. And you probably are familiar with the singles from that, like 3D or 7, which was like a big song of the summer. Like, so it's a lot of like, you know, we're fucking, life's good. <laughs> it's all happening. It's fun. It's bouncy. We're getting down. And then the second half of the album is like what happens when you lose love. And I have to say that when I listen to it, I enjoy, I really enjoy it. I think that it doesn't like reinvent anything to where it's like, I've never heard this before. I don't think it's like, it's in no way autobiographical to him, but there's like no skips. I put it on even this morning to like take my kids to school and it's like, you know, 35, 40 minutes. And so I like dropped all the kids off and like, that's about how long it took me to go from point beginning to the end. And I was like, this whole thing is just, it's very likable. And so I feel like, you know, I'm a commercial fiction writer. I like when things just hit the mainstream hard, but in a quality way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Golden really hits the mainstream. It's not, there's nothing experimental that happens. It's just solidly pop good. Okay. And not just like, that's hard to do. So I respect it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. If you enjoy our podcast, you have our patrons to thank, at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop recs, Blow up your skin with K Merch Rex. Find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. So let's take this to the Patreon because I love asking the Patreon questions. Okay. If you're not in the Patreon, rectify that and come in the <laughs> Patreon. <laughs> and so I did a question yesterday that was a subplot shout out to listeners that was, we're going to be talking B stories. What are some that you really like or ones that you really didn't? And so, you know, if you want to pull these up too, but I'm going to, I'm going to shout out, I'll shout out, let's say three, just out of the blue. And we can kind of talk through them. Yeah. So one person I'm not going to say names because I think, you know, but one person said Reaper and Sunny from Goblin. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, of course. I mean, yeah, I, I, they, I brought them up later. Like, yeah, they hundred percent. Yes. It's just, it's fantastic. Okay. Another one. I'm going to do one that, okay. How about this one? The side romance of Puck Jin and Maid Serving oh, Kim and Elkin. So of good. Souls. Mm -hmm. So the person wrote, it could have been annoying filler, but the actors made it funny and sincere. They were fantastic. I love them. To me, they were so much like the heart of that show, of that drama. I loved them so much. Mm. And then one other person, I like this one a lot. Itawan class and Hyun Yi becoming a chef and becoming herself oh or themselves yeah i do yeah. love that that's a mm -hmm. that's a very good b plot very very good somebody else mentioned they okay they had questions but they mentioned the ducklings from oh, crash landing damn, on like you you're are you looking at the scripts you're taking all my stuff <laughs> oh, okay. but, 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 but basically you but can the, still but, mention them so what they said though was how did they handle going back to North Korea? So they were held up like they wanted more of the Dr. Yeah. stories. Like, how did yeah. they handle going back to North Korea and processing their experiences? Aww. And then how did Captain Ree end up no longer being Captain Ree and instead being allowed to be a pianist again? 
So in many Korean dramas, the B plots often involve secondary characters or relationships. So pick an example and unpack why it worked or didn't. Okay, so I brought up um, Captain Ree's ducklings from Crash Landing on You. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Okay, um, but why it worked? Nice. Like why it worked? Because like they could have been like caricatures, and they weren't really. Like they were these super sincere, like fully you know fully formed characters who all had some sort of growth, like big time growth. And it wasn't, mm-hmm. their stories weren't just being Captain Ree's ducklings. Like, they had their own stories in their own rights as well. Um, so, I, like, they all had their own backstories. Like, they were just so well done, like, fully fleshed out characters. But the way that they helped the A-plot, the the main story, is they helped, you know, Yoon Sari and Ri jung Hook like, see sides of each other that they wouldn't have had they not also been, you know, dealing with this whole ensemble of people. Um, if it had just been, like, Yoon Sari and Captain Ree, like, alone the whole time, they probably never would have spoken to each other as much as they did. They never would have, you know, like, think of, think of like, Sari, the first time she thinks she's going to leave, because we know that, like, her, you know, rescue gets thwarted, like, millions of times. Um, but when she thinks she's going to leave and she's giving everybody like gifts before she goes. Um, and it shows how much she has invested in all of these people as her friends and Captain Ree gets to see that. But then we also get to see his jealousy at how loving she is to all of them. Um, and that's, you know, one of my favorite, you know, memes of the drama is him, you know, in full uniform, just like plopping down in his bed and pouting because she didn't like give him anything um you know to say goodbye so yeah i mean they were a really big vehicle for the love story between um sari and captain Ree, but they also like i just enjoyed watching them even when they were on their own like when they first get to south korea like that's some of my favorite stuff of the whole drama it's just watching them try to navigate their way through like a convenience store buying ramen and rice <laughs> i know so I'm going to actually get to talk about My Perfect Stranger, which I haven't really talked about much on the podcast. I did watch it um, and I liked it. I didn't love it, but it did have a good um, secondary romance that was also even like it was it was a, a very good plot that involved the secondary romance. Um, so the main gist of My Perfect Stranger is two people go back in time and they have to solve murders that happened in the past uh in order to well they want to obviously save the people who are murdered and the hero is murdered in the future by the same murderer so they have to catch him in the past to prevent the hero's murder in the future i know it's a time travel it's confusing but what's interesting is that the heroine goes back into in time and it's her parents hometown and her parents in the future or in present day (laughs) are divorced it's terrible like they have a terrible relationship they're both miserable to a degree and um in the past when they time travel back the parents she witnesses her parents meeting for the first time as Mm. like high school students and i'm trying not to give too much away but it's very interesting because at first she's like oh my god stay away mom from dad because he's a terrible person he's gonna make your life miserable and so she like hates this like random like high school boy and he doesn't know why she obviously can't say oh hey i'm your daughter from the future but there's like reasons and they all for the reason that her dad is miserable in the future and it all ties to these murders in the past and i became so invested in the parents like blooming relationship like it was like very cute like high school young love and although it was definitely like the b plot um i was i just i loved that i liked it i mean there was like kind of a main romance but i wasn't invested in that at all the the main the main plot of the of my perfect stranger was the murder mystery but watching this couple almost get like a second chance at love in the past and like fix what broke them was was really cool so i'm gonna circle back to 
crash landing on you, which is funny because like, this isn't even like my drama anymore. Like, I mean, I like it, but it's not like it's in like my very typey top anymore. Mm -hmm. However, Kim Jong Hyun's portrayal of Sung Joon. <sighs> so good. Mm -hmm. The best. I mean, to me now that's like the whole drama almost. And mm -hmm. so I feel like there's a real heartbreaking sad end here. But his arc is just amazing. Yes. And I felt like it really helped be a strong B story to what was happening on the main, on the main stage with the main couple. Right. The secondary romance really became like, it took on a life of its own. It never like overshadowed, but it became very, very investing. And at the mm -hmm. beginning I was not invested in this as a B story. I was kind of like, whatever, it's fine. Like the B story sometimes just is what it is. But it like as it kept going, it just kept getting more layered, more nuanced, and hooked me. And just in that way of again, like making the regime seem hard and it was tragic. And I think we needed to have some deep yes. sadness because of so much of the drama had like they were trying to play it both ways of like showing poignancy and sadness and also having levity so you didn't want to like jump off a bridge. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they kept a little bit more levity in that main side. And so we could get to some more tragedy in the B romance. And like you said, like I, I was the same way in the beginning where I was like, I don't really care about this story. Like I'm, I'm here for, you know, Hyun Bin and Sun Yoo Jin. And then it just like sneaks up on you. And then all of a sudden I'm sobbing at the end because of Ugh. the way the B story pans out, even though that's the only way it could have ended. It could have been different, but also like, I mean, I'll, I'll go to like, you know, the, the second part of that, like secondary rumors, which is Sedan's character. And she could not have grown into the person that she was unless she had mm -hmm. loved him and lost him. I know, right? Talk about character yeah. growth for her. The best. Uh, look, I'll never be over Chloe. No. Ever. Korean dramas often feature love triangles or complicated romantic relationships as B-plots. Share a time this subplot impacted the main characters and the central romance in the story. Look, I'm, like, weirdly a sucker for love triangles. I love them. I don't, like, in real life, like, I don't think that they're actually, like, a thing. <laughs> I mean, I've never been in a love triangle, but I don't know. <laughs> right? I oh, know. You haven't? No. I have, and it is not fun. It did not feel fun. It felt very No, that's what I'm saying. Like, I can't imagine sad. it even being enjoyable in real life. No, I've been in a few, and they're not good. A few? <laughs> No, I've never. They, I have. I've been in. I believe you. No, I. This is me absolutely believing you, and I think you've. Yeah, I do believe you. I two just two to three, two yeah. to three. Mm -hmm. But I, I love, I love watching them, especially when, like, I think a really well done love triangle in a in a fictional romance is one where it's not immediately clear who the heroine is going to end up with or who you want her to end up with. Like, I want to be conflicted because that means that I've got some very well-drawn but also complicated characters. And I didn't mean to use the word drawn, but now I'm going to, like, as a pun, but I'm talking about Extraordinary You. Um, and this, if you aren't familiar with this drama, get out there and watch it. Megan. Um, mm. Megan. Uh, mm -hmm. Because everybody, every character in this drama... Um, is a character in a uh, comic book, and some of them figure it out. So our love triangle is between our heroine, who's Un Dano, played by Kim Hae Yoon, and the love triangle is um, with her and Baek Young, played by Lee Jae Yuk, and Haru, played by Ro Woon. I mean, this will forever be one of my favorite dramas, just because of the cast. But also this love triangle, so well done, because not only do we have these different, you know, these men like vying for, for her affection, but it's also the complication of them being characters in a comic who don't have free will all the time because they have to act out what is written. Um, and the fun part about it is that um, Undeno is written to be head over heels in love with Baek Young, even though he treats her like absolute garbage. And then comes this character, Haru, who's supposed to be a, an unnamed, like not even secondary character, like just an unnamed extra who 
makes his way in the story, finds his free will and becomes the love interest. Um, just so well done and so complicated. Um, and then tied to, you know, some, I won't give all the spoilers away, but tied to some, you know, other backstories uh, of their characters that are very unexpected. And yeah, I mean, like, a really well done love triangle is one that's going to keep you on the edge of your seat until the end of the drama. And you'll keep waffling back and forth between who should it be? If it's super, super obvious, then I don't really consider it a love triangle. I just consider one person having unrequited love and the other two are a couple. So yeah, Extraordinary You is one of my favorite, favorite love triangles. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about startup. I was I hoping know you that would. <laughs> not, I know that that is, I know that that is a controversial uh, drama, but look, I freaking loved it and I loved the triangle and I loved how it ended. But then I am a Nam Dosan stan. So like, sorry, I just I, I am. I loved Good Boy very, very much. I just didn't want him in this romance. So but I liked I did like the love triangle, though in this drama and i'm kind of known as a person who doesn't really like love triangles my other example was itawan class and i couldn't stand it <laughs> i hated that love but that triangle. one was see in and itawan a- class to me it wasn't it wasn't a good one because i knew yeah. i knew well, I, I, I knew who it was supposed to be in my mind well you know. i just whatever that whole whatever but uh i love startup i I like that there was so much growth for yes. Good Boy um, and Nam Do San. Um, I mean, I would say, yeah, Sol Dami, the, the Bay Suzy character, was, was a little more one note. But I still think she um, overcame a lot. And I think she learned a lot about herself within the love triangle. Um, and yeah, I thought I personally loved that love triangle. I, I love that one too. It, you're making me like want to rewatch it, like just talking about them. I know, but right? it's also all oh, the kiss on the what roof. I think, <laughs> what I think is really well done in this love triangle is the setup of the drama that is a bait mm-hmm. and switch for who you think the hero Absolutely. is. And to and this day, I'm like, I was so confused in the beginning because because I you know. were you were already talking about it. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I know. And, and you know, again, I had said before, if I watched it live and didn't know, um, it might have been a different story. But uh, I did know who she was going to end up with. But either way, I loved it. And I'm going to talk about, and it's funny because I haven't talked about this in a long time. And I feel like I talked about it in a recent pod, which is She Was Pretty. And in it, we yeah, have... We talked about it last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a choice that happens. And it's either you can fall in love with your childhood boyfriend who doesn't even recognize <laughs> that his dates he's going on is a whole different human. But then eventually loves you and it's fine because childhood love trumps all. Or the secret, super famous, super hot, albeit problematic in real life. Mm. Kim Shin Hyuk, played by Super Junior's Trump loving uh, Choi oh, Si Wan. <laughs> but he is a beautiful man, even if I he know. loves and respects problematic things. Anyway, in this character, he in this movie, he is a character who is a secret genius, famous writer, and loves the heroine just as she is. With her frizzy hair, with her red cheeks which is apparently enough to make you a social outcast in this movie. (laughs) He sees her, loves her, is obsessed with her, only wants her as who she is. She does not have to do the beauty glow up, straighten her hair and put on the makeup to get the guy like she does for the hero. I don't get it. Yeah. I've never seen it. And it's because I think that would, that would drive. I don't get it because he is amazing in it. He even has a cute, because we all love the romance. Wasn't he the first SOS that you ever wrote? Yes. I mean, he's messed, that character's messed me up forever. He calls the heroine Jackson because she wears short black pants and little white socks like Michael Jackson. And so his nickname for her is Jackson. That's adorable. I mean, it's just everything about him is 
fucking perfect, except for that Park Sejun is the her- hero who's just hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't I just I I will never be over it. But the whole the whole the whole setup was essentially to make me realize life is pain. Yeah, life is pain. <laughs> so, how do cultural and societal elements influence the themes and conflicts explored in the B plot? B plots of Korean dramas. Can you provide an example of a B plot that touches on cultural or societal issues? So my brain went to Tomorrow, the drama Tomorrow for this one, um, which is a drama of vignettes that has a past lives romance B story and all the B stories of the vignettes. Um, So I think we have a great example of this here because it's dealing with so many different things. And all the B stories, um, like the smaller ones, the vignettes, deal with different aspects of suicide. So that's one thing to note, you know, as far as trigger warning for this drama. We've talked about it before, but um, the main sort of framework of Tomorrow is that Rowoon interferes with the job of a couple of Grim Reapers who they're the reaper's job is to keep people from committing suicide and he steps in to save somebody who you know who almost drowns and he kind of like messes up the job i mean the person gets saved it's fine but then he is in a coma and he's in trouble with the with the reaper society and basically he can shorten his coma if he agrees to work for the anti-suicide squad of the reapers for six months and so he is basically like living as a reaper for for a while so he is a part of this squad now who is trying to keep people from committing suicide and all of the um all of the vignettes of people who are considering taking their lives range from like a partner who wants to die because her husband died to a woman who is being bullied who wants to take her own life to even a dog a dog who is terminally ill and doesn't want its owner to see him die. What's the dog's what's Stop. the dog's name, Megan? Do you remember? I just Kong. I just Kong. forgot. Kong! That's it. Kong. Kong. Oh, God, and it's a Kong. tiny, like little scrappy, like dirty Pomeranian, I think. Like or something close to that. Oh but like the No, I think it was so know, cute. it was so cute, but like it was like all yeah. mangy because it was like sick and it was like literally like ran away. And right. I remembered like texting Megan and being like I'm crying for a suicidal dog right now. I bawled over that <laughs> stupid suicidal dog like you would not believe. I am still mad yes. at that drama because of that. No, it, I love it. But, but, but like even and I won't I won't get into the past life story because that is like really the the big sort of spoilery part that unfolds. So I won't get into that because I don't want to ruin that because that for me that was a B plot like a B romance. That was the only ro- that was the only romance was this like mystery story Mm -hmm. um and you don't find out about it really until the end um and i would have watched an entire drama of that b story but as far as like societal issues like it's not just dealing with suicide but it is dealing with all of the either like mental or physical health issues that the people who are contemplating suicide are dealing with as well and so i think right it's like how we treat veterans there was like a veteran like there's a comfort women you know like episode Mm -hmm. and so yeah it is yeah, the veteran one. Oh my gosh, that was so that was very emotional. But yeah, like I, know, I think that the way that tomorrow is formulated and written and, you know, in this sort of vignette style lets us unpack a lot of these like societal and cultural issues and I thought it was done really really well. Um yeah, and if that's a drama that you haven't seen, um that is where I fell in love with Rowoon and I have never looked back. So for me, I know we we talk about business proposal a lot because of the secondary romance. But uh, what I think we don't always mention is that it talks about like the spying, the spy cam oh, aspect yeah. mm-hmm. that is very prevalent in, in Korea. I've like listened to podcasts and things about it. Um, and so I think that that was a really interesting um, part of the drama that they like showed uh, basically a man gave the 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 female character a a lamp and she didn't know that there was a spy cam inside and so he was able to see videos of her in her apartment and it's not it's not the secondary romance partner that does this by the way like 
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. Sorry. No, it no, just no, got no, a little bit no, no, confused because no. you brought she up has... the secondary romance. The secondary romance is fantastic. Sorry. Kim and Q would never do that. I just mean, I feel like... When... <laughs> Right. I feel like that's what, when we talk about business or when people talk about business proposal and you say something about a secondary romance or the B plot, that's yes, what people talk yes. about. Is that, is that romance? And I'm sorry, you're right. But uh, I just wanted to bring up like that other, the B plot about it, which I mean, that lasted several mm-hmm. episodes was um, the whole spy cam incident. So, so something in the rain I'm going to talk about because when we're talking about the B plot and like, societal expectations and things like that so we have a love story but it's really impacted by the pressures that um son ye jin's character yun jina faces in her home in terms of what they expect from her as a child what her duty is to respect her parents through the decisions she makes who she loves what she's going to do for her life and that really becomes like the fodder so the b story You can't have the A story without the B story because the romance is completely impacted by what's happening in the home, but with her relationship, especially with her mom. And so I felt like that and like the duty and the respect she feels like she has to have in honoring her parents' wishes, even when they're in direct opposition to like her true self and her feelings for the hero. And so I think that that's a really strong element. I mean, it makes you wild watching it (laughs) because (laughs) we are conditioned to root for people being like their whole self and true to themselves. But the fact of the matter is, is that many times family expectations have a very, very big impact in the kind of decisions we make in our life. And that's reflected a lot in this drama. Uh, Korean dramas are known for their emotional storytelling. How do B-plots contribute to the emotional resonance of the narrative? And can you share examples of B-plots that left a strong emotional impact? So I was going to talk about Sunny and Reaper, but some, like Patreon brought that up and that's totally fine. I don't want to, I don't want to like belabor that. Like if you haven't seen Goblin, like I've talked about it enough already, um, go watch <laughs> it. Cause Sunny and, and Reaper are such a huge, like emotional heart of that story. Um, especially when you find out, you know, like what connects them. Um, and I brought this up before, but I'm going to bring it up again because as far as like an emotional, emotional resonance that I wasn't expecting. And just to show you like how K dramas do this so well is bad and crazy. You know, there is, there is, there is a, there is a romance in bad and crazy, but the romance is not the A plot. It is not the main plot. Mm Mm-mm. Okay, so like Sul Yol and Kay's relationship is the main story in um, in Bad and Crazy, and you know trying to to solve you know the whole like sort of murder situation that's going on, serial killer situation. Um, but I would even say that the serial killer is the is a B story. That like the main story is is Sul Yol and Kay, and it starts out as very antagonistic and then it gets very funny and then it gets heart-wrenching and it was one of those things that just snuck up on me i thought i was in for an action drama between you know an action bromance with you know two of my favorite actors and you know Lee dong wook and we had june and it turned into uh one of the dramas that i think i've cried the hardest in (laughs) like super unexpected and I can't tell you much more about it because it's one of those that, like, I will not spoil this drama for you. Go and watch it. It's amazing. I didn't expect mm-hmm. it to be this amazing. And when Megan watched it and was like, you guys have to watch this, I was like, I I thought I was, like, doing a solid for Megan, like, watching an action drama. And then I was like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> like, this had you. all of my heart. That's why I said I was like, all of my heart. Amy yeah. me. I knew it. I knew you'd yeah. like it. I was like, I think I'm going to hit a home run if I tell her. And I, I, really I think that's one of the things that I love the most about K-dramas is that they hit me in a way emotionally um, that a lot of Western television hasn't been able to do lately, you know, save for, you know, like Ted Lasso. Just, yeah. I, and I, I don't always need to be like brought to tears. But I think the fact that K-dramas do this so well, like run you through that range of emotions, um, that I really do appreciate a drama that does that well, that can give you, you know, the sort of enemies to lovers that we get in this, in this sort of bromance here. And to the extent where my heart is ripped from my chest at the end. 
So um, I'm going to talk about If You Wish Upon Me. Uh, so when God. He- <laughs> talk about another one that I just was like a blubbering mess. You know, the lead the leads in this are Ji Chong Uk, Sung Nong Il, and Su Young. So the main romance is between Ji Chong Uk and Su Young, and it is a great it like it's it's lovely, it's kind of like enemies to friends to lovers. Um it's a great romance, but there is a secondary plot line involving Ji Chong Uk's childhood friend and his former like gangster buddy. Don't even. This is my like <laughs> Jong Jong Sok Jun is a gangster and it's because he doesn't he really never almost had a choice in life he had a really really rough childhood and he did the only thing he could which he you know which was was join this gang so he is a violent bad man but he loves 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 ha jun kyung and that is uh his also his his childhood friend along with ji chung books and he will do just about anything for her. And it, it what's crazy? I mean, he is like a terribly violent guy in this drama, and he's totally the villain. But yet the the vulnerability he shows to her, and the care that he'll do for her, like Amy and I were wrecked by this by this secondary Nam Tae-hoon. plot Nam line. Tae-hoon. Nam Tae-hoon. <laughs> yeah, because it's not yeah. just their romance. Their romance spurs actions that greatly affect the main plot and the main romance. And so it's one of those dramas where things are happening separately. You know, the the, the, the subplots are happening separately, but the drama does a really good job at like converging them and literally in this drama converges them in like a car crash. I mean, it's like... It's great. I mean, it's great. that's oh, like what she asks him to the do. What she romance? asks him to do, oh. and he does it. I know you have to just see oh. it, but the secondary romance in this will tear yes. your freaking heart out. Yeah, and I, f- I feel like I got off topic with bad and crazy. Like, I, I don't know what is the B plot there. I don't, you know what I mean? Like that's I know. the whole thing. The I drama's know, crazy, crazy, but I, I do think whether <laughs> whether Soul and. K are the a, are the B plot or the main story? I don't know, but they are just a fantastic emotional driving force of that drama. Um, but yeah, yeah, if you wish upon me, my, ugh, wrecked me. That that couple wrecked yeah. me. I'm going to go with Reply 1988, and I am going to go with the older romance, like text dad oh. story. Oh. And here's why I think that one really works because the a lot of the story is about like the young kids in the street and like the first loves and like their trials and tribulations. But we get these different glimpses of the parents as well. And sometimes they're more fleshed out like when they try to make the snowman for the little girl or you know, we see like different like worries that they have for their kids. But having a, a romance in it, I mean, I would have taken a lot more romance, to be perfectly honest, but giving a B romance to two of the adults. Because mm-hmm. when you watch the show, you almost watch it like you're a kid. And like how it's funny to me now, like my kids are the main characters in their lives. Like they are mm-hmm. fully their own main characters. And I'm just like this parent walk on character that like appears sometimes to be the parent either to be like, is your homework done? Or let me take you to school or to like, be a trusted advisor sometimes. But I fully know that like their day to day, they're not thinking about their mom as like a whole ass human, they're thinking about themselves as the show. And I do with my parents. I mean, like, we all do it. It's just like what we do. And so in this, it was just fun to see some time where these parents are the main character of their own lives. They have hopes and desires. They have physical desire. They have emotional, you know, they want to reach out and be connected to others. They had a past history that they're building on. Um, And so it was just a nice moment to like, kind of come out of that. Like it's just a necessary and natural, but narcissistic bent of when you are the younger person, the world is revolving around you to remember that like, yeah, there's all these other stories that are happening in orbit and we're kind of all our own main characters. I love that. Mm. B plots in Korean drama sometimes feature family dynamics and conflicts. How do these subplots reflect the importance of family in Korean culture and how do they add depth to the main storyline? 
So I'm going to talk about Because This Is My First Life, which, I mean, just the entire drama is steeped in Korean culture from the the fact that they, <laughs> the whole plot of the movie is a fake marriage so that two members of a different sex can live together. I mean, that is like, <laughs> and uh, that, that was kind of y- uniquely Korean over there because that's, uh, they, they needed to do that uh, to make the hero's parents happy so um because his mother doesn't want him living with you know like a single woman um and same with the heroine her parents don't want her living with a single man so there's a there's that but then also the um heroine's relationship with her mother was something that like even now is is one of my favorite kind of uh, mother-daughter relationships or um in k-dramas and yeah, and even down to like the hero helping uh, the heroine's family make kimchi. Just it just felt very rich in understanding Korean culture, in in respecting your parents, um, and also to kind of sometimes the conservatism of how they view relationships. So I'm gonna touch on filial piety in the one I'm gonna talk about, which is Heirs, um, which is a drama that I love. And it's it's an even ho drama in Kimu Bin. This is where I fell for Kimu Bin. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's so it's, it's it's a little campy and over the top with the filial piety. But I think it's something that you know we see a lot in K dramas. So in Airs, Kim Tan's father is like the CEO archetype. His mother is like a concubine basically like she is the the mistress and she lives in the house with the father but she is not married to him um the wife is you know who is the stepmother is kim tan's principal at his school or whatever the head of school is you know called there and then we've got his half brother who despises him because he thinks that kim tan is out to basically usurp his place in the family business when really kim tan has like zero interest he just wants to get the girl (laughs) and it is like this this big sort of like you know tangled web of you know sort of like family honor and filial piety and you know how he wants to he always wants to defend his mother and do right by his mother but he's also bound by that filial piety to his father. Um, and so while while I talk a lot about this drama in that I loved, um, you know, Cho Young-do, you know, played by Kim Woo-bin, and that he was the character that really stood out for me um, and had the most growth, even though he had more growing to do at the end, I will say that what I did love about Lee Min-ho's character, Kim Tan, is that you know, he did end up standing up for himself in the end, standing up for his mother, standing up to his father in order to like sort of take the reins of his own life rather than just do what he is supposed to do or do what is expected of him, which we see all the time when we're looking at, you know, characters who come from, you know, wealthy chable type families is like your happiness is way down on the ladder of, you know, what matters. Um, so I, I really I did like that that it highlighted that aspect, but also showed a way forward for somebody to sort of take charge of their own life. Um, I'm going to talk about when the camellia blooms and the relationship between the heroine and the hero's mom, because it was an interesting one. Because she, the hero's mom, had raised him as a single mom, and she kind of just knew the limitations of that, how difficult it was, and was like. I don't want that impact to like bleed anywhere near my son. My son's like totally in love with you, but this is like not his child. This is not his burden to bear. However, while she's kind of like, you know, sometimes we see these like evil caricatures of mothers. She doesn't quite fit into that because she's also genuinely friends with the heroine. And at like one point they're like besties and like calling each other bestie. And so it's like bestie. Yes, I love you. (laughs) And not for my son. And then like there becomes that like distance and divide. And I felt as if, you know, Yes, we see in a lot of um, Korean dramas that centering of valuing like family, the decentering of self and like personal desire should take a backseat to like the 
the impact it would have on like the, the family as a whole. And so, um, and so, yeah, I felt like there was a lot of tension there, but it was painful because they did have that shared history of being single parents. And they also had common ground in genuinely liking each other. However, the mom was just basically like, this is not Disneyland. Like my son is not your lifeline and like real life is hard. And I want him to, to get to have a chance to have like a clean slate, not like your baggage. <laughs> yeah. That's Which a good, the son had different ideas about, but yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's, that's a really good yeah. example. Um, so discuss the role of friendship and camaraderie in B plots of Korean dramas. How do these relationships evolve and how do they impact the character's growth and choices? So look, we did a podcast a little while ago on a short little drama called Hit the Spot that I really, really loved. It was one of those where we were talking about, should we do this for the pod? And I'm like, I'm just going to go check out the first episode. And then I watched the whole thing. Um, and it's a, yeah. it's a short drama, so you can totally do that. It's eight episodes, and they're not, they're not long. Um, but Hit the Spot is... I mean, it's about two friends who work for a publisher and end up doing a podcast on, you know, basically like sexual pleasure. But what's really great about this is we have um, HeJ, who is, I mean, you know, it, it's it's an ensemble drama, but I'd say, you know, HeJ is the, the main character in her own story, and she's played by Hani, and her best friend Mina is played by Wuhi. And in the beginning of the drama, um, HeJ is in a really like dead end relationship and she tries to spice it up by telling her partner what he, what she wants sexually. And he gets all like, you know, poor me, you're emasculating me. I'm not, you know, satisfying you sexually. And he, you know, Ugh, yeah, he's gross. gross and he, he seemingly le like leaves her, but then of course comes like sniveling back, but she doesn't take him, which is great. Um, but then she goes on this journey of like sort of self discovery and, you know, sex positivity and embracing the fact that it's okay to want pleasure. We should all want pleasure and, and we should all, we all deserve pleasure. And she learns a lot of that from Mina, from her best friend. Like Mina shows her like her trunk full of dildos. She takes her to a sex toy shop and basically like helps, you know, bring her out of her, her shell of, you know, sort of like taboo that she's been living in. And, you know, helps her realize that it's okay for me to want this for myself. In fact, I deserve this. Like I shouldn't, you know, I, I shouldn't even question this. Like I, it's my God given right to be satisfied. And I, I really liked that. And that really came about from this friendship. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, and then the flip, the flip flop mm -hmm. is that he teaches Mina that like love doesn't always bite you in the ass that, you know, that there is, there is the real deal out there. And it mm -hmm. is it is it is played by Roy Choi. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about twenty five twenty one, which I know neither of you have seen. But uh, so the main story is um, about Nahito, who is played by our favorite Kim Tae Ri. And um, I mean, the drama was billed basically as like a romance between her and Nam Joo Hyuk. But I found that Nahito's relationship with Koyu Rim was friendship was one of the best of the show. So they started out as enemies and and fencing rivals. And I mean, absolute enemies. They were nasty to each other. They didn't like each other. And eventually Nahito realizes she thinks she all she wants is to be like you Rim. She thinks you Rim, who is a fencing champion, has everything. And in getting to know you, Rim, she realizes that just being a fencing champion isn't everything. You, Rim, actually has a pretty difficult life. Her parents don't have a lot of money. Um, they really depend on her and like what she like her uh, her sponsorships and things. And um, you, Rim, is also very lonely. Uh, she has she has no friends. She's never dated. Um, whereas Nahito is is pretty social and outgoing, and their friendship is really beautiful and it teaches Nahito so much about what it means to win and for uh you rim her relationship with Nahito ha really enables her to um make some really difficult decisions later in her life and so yeah I just I to this day I romance 
of 2521 is not my favorite, but the friendship between Nahido and Koyu Rim is fantastic. I'm going to just touch on briefly our blues. And I think that what happened in this is an interesting choice in terms of writing, which is it's a series of vignettes where you take a small seaside Jeju community that are kind of linked together pretty thematically by a fish market. And you tell individual stories every few, ep- like pretty much every episode, like every episode is maybe like, mm, I think it's three episodes per vignette, roughly. Um, Mm -hmm. if I can remember right. And so they become like the A story and then everyone else becomes B stories. But what's fun is that like everyone gets their moment in the sun of like being the primary story. And then you get to see how either the stories are like leading up before they become the A story as a B story, or you get to see that are like conclusions later. So you have like a teenage Romeo and Juliet story there are their fathers who are kind of like the Montagues and Capulets who like based on old grievances hate each other yet their kids knock each other up. There is um, a woman who has become was very poor and has become quite wealthy through the sweat of her own labor and an old first love reaches out to her who's fallen on hard economic times and basically kind of doesn't want to, but feels like he has no choice but to dodgily seduce her to try to get her money. Like, there's just all these stories that happen that are fairly poignant, and then you get to see them, like, unpack around as the B stories later. So I kind of like that, like, that cycling through where you don't have a principal main story and then a strong backstory or B story. It's fun sometimes to see the subplots become the main plots and then switch back into the subplots again. Yeah, I like that. That's, um... Interesting writing. I like yeah. that a lot. Korean dramas often blend multiple genres, including romantic comedy, melodrama, thriller, and historical genres. How do B plots adapt to fit these diverse genres and contribute to the overall storytelling? So I think that Alchemy of Souls is a really great example of this because while we do have our main character in Jungkook, played by E. J. Ook. And, you know, what is going on with him and um, Mudok. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Mudok, who, who we, I mean, we know, we know who she is. We know she's an assassin in somebody else's body. Um, you know that in the very beginning, so it's not a spoiler. But anyway, it is their story overall, right? But then there are so many B plots and I think it's really what makes this drama is all of the B plots. And like, you're super invested in all of them. Um, and I think characterization in all of our B characters is what gives us this sort of broad range of running us through all of the emotions and doing it well and in a balanced way. Um, because really, you know, it, it's, it's a romance and it's a palace intrigue and it's a, you know, it's a whodunit and it's a who's a soul shifter and who's in whose body. And, you know, it's so, it's so many different things, but it, it, it all boils down to, you know, Jungkook whose magic has been blocked from him his whole life. And it's all, why has it been blocked? Why hasn't he been allowed to become a mage? And what will happen if he does become a mage? And what what does that mean for the future of this, you know, fictional sort of realm? Um, and it is all of the characters, all of the B characters, I think, that sort of supercharge this with all of those different genres. Um, and, and it's the characterization and how well the characterization is done that we know when we see a certain character on screen it, it triggers that emotion in us and already lets us know, oh, we just had something like really, really heavy. Now we're going to get some comic relief. And I'll just give you some examples of, of how that's been done with uh, a lot of the characters. Um, so like, let's say, you know, something really, you know, big and sort of tragic has just happened. And then we see the crown prince on screen and we know that there's going to be some, some comedy, some levity, because he is surprisingly, you think he's going to be this, you know, hard ass sort of stick in the mud. And he is one of the funniest parts of the drama. Um, and so I think that because we get to know him and get to know his character, that we are prepared emotionally for what's coming. Um, we know that when we see Jin Mu, the the King's Guanju, <laughs> the right hand man, um, we know that when we see Jin Mu, some, some shit's going down. 
like something sinister is happening <laughs> that only we know. Like we can look at that, like that, that evil goatee and that, you know, cocked eyebrow. And we know that there's some evil going on, even, even if nobody else does. Um, when we see, um, you know, so Yule, our, our lovely, lovely martyr, you know, second male lead, so Yule, we know that we're going to get, like, there's going to be a badass fight scene and we're going to get some, you know, some good action shots. Um, and it's just because we, we know when we see these characters. Um, and then, you know, that, that all sort of plays its part in the whole grand scheme of this drama, which really, like, the, the grand, you know, outcome of this drama is not anything funny at all. Um, it's very major and tragic and beautiful. And this is one of my top five dramas. And I will, you know, I, I would love to talk about it every podcast if we could, but I don't want to ruin it for you because I want you all to watch it because we all loved it. Um, and I, I will just toss out there, this is a non sequitur to, you know, the characterization being so good and all of our secondary characters there. But I will toss out to you that um, my friend Tracy, who I've been getting into K-dramas, um, has been watching Alchemy of Souls. And I said, mm -hmm. I just need to let you know that um, I want you to call me, text me when you get to episode 20, because Megan didn't think it was that big of a cliffhanger. So I want to know what you thought. <laughs> oh, and she texts me. She's like, how is that not a cliffhanger? I'm like, I know. Oh, Tracy. <laughs> anyway, so but yeah, I think when you have a big ensemble cast like this, um, and, and again, that'll, it'll go back to like crash landing on you. It's those ensemble casts that I think do a really good job of running you through all those emotions. I'm not saying that smaller dramas and smaller casts can't, but I think it's the characterization that really helps it all fit together. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to mention Josen Attorney, A Morality. Uh, we didn't do a deep dive on this, but I did watch it. This is a um, historical with Udo Wan and Bona. And... So this drama is interesting because it started out um, a little bit more silly than I intended. Although, you know, the main plot line is that Udo Wan is a, an attorney who is looking to avenge uh, the death of his parents. And, you know, pretty classic, you know, revenge plot line. Um, and it's kind of caperish to a degree. And but then... Um, there is a B-plot when they introduce his uh, essentially long-lost sister. And that B-plot is actually the part of the drama that made me cry. Uh, I didn't really care about the romance between Udo Wan and Bona. Um, I think most people who have seen the drama agree that their chemistry wasn't that great. But his chemistry with his long-lost sister was incredible. <laughs> and um, that was the part of the drama that really brought in the heart. And if they had not brought in that B plot, I think I would have dropped the drama. But as soon as they brought her in uh, and you learn who she is and you learn what happened to her, then all of a sudden I was like, wow, this drama's got a lot of heart. So I'm going with Mr. Sunshine. So Mr. Sunshine has a lot of melodrama and tragedy in the main plot. And then there's this secondary plot that are the three suitors to the heroine that kind of become an unlikely group of bromance friends and it and their interactions become very comedic and it helps because there's a lot of pain and sadness and horror in like the main plot of mr sunshine and yet like when the three of them get together at like the bar and drink and they're all kind of like mm, frenemies <laughs> it just makes it there's a lot of levity that comes there but they all have like an important part in the A plot as well. It's just their friendship happens to be a B plot. And I think that that juxtaposition between like their main stories are very poignant, very dramatic, but their friendship is this comedic relief is a fun play on how you can even cycle kind of main characters back into being like a part of the B story with their dynamics with other characters. That's a good one. We've be, we've be plotted this out. We did. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we yeah, did. Yeah. This this whole podcast had a lot of B plots. Yeah. Like the there you know, many we, the earlobe <laughs> the earlobe hair yeah. is its own B plot. <laughs> yeah, we had our own B plots. Like this Full is crazy. subplot. <laughs> uh, that was really fun though. I mean, I was kind of like cuz I was like 
oh, this is hard to think of dramas. I was like, well, every drama. Every <laughs> drama. That's the thing is every drama. You're like, what could I Which choose drama every has single one I've ever watched? <laughs> I know. I know. So, because I was like, oh, we should ask people. <laughs> For <laughs> but I'm like, Yeah, I'm like, I don't even know what to say. But um, yeah, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we love talking. I mean, we love doing this. And I, I, I love doing episodes like this because then we get to talk about as many dramas as possible and some yeah. and some that well, i'll talk I mean, you know some that we'll talk about every chance we get and that's 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 okay you want to know what drama i did not mention i'm not a robot i'm not a robot did not mention that i just feel or like healer I or healer i mentioned healer about the mole hair, but <laughs> oh, i didn't shit, mention yeah. <laughs> but not in not in not as an example <laughs> not as an example okay <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for tonight. This is a long one, so I hope you guys. Thanks for listening, it. everyone. Yep. Annyeong. 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 da. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T. Dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K-pop and K-skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, Annyeong!